Hello, and welcome to Decision NYC with Ben Max. I'm Ben Max, your host and executive editor of Gotham Gazette. The 2021 New York City election season is underway, and it's poised to be the most significant municipal election in decades. All of city government is on the ballot, and because so few incumbents are eligible to run for their current seats due to term limits, New Yorkers are electing many new office holders and the next roster of leadership for our city. There will be a new mayor of New York City elected here in 2021, as well as a new city controller, new borough presidents, many new city council members. And that's not all that's on the ballot. There's also another very important election happening in the city and specifically in Manhattan, but not for a city government position. There's a crowded and competitive race for Manhattan district attorney the top prosecutor, the top law enforcement official of New York County, otherwise known as Manhattan. It's a position of immense power and importance. The office holder makes key decisions that impact the lives of many New Yorkers and millions who don't live in the borough or even the city. Millions of people who call Manhattan home, work there, or just visit the borough. Decisions of life and death, freedom and incarceration, crime, punishment, and more. This is one of the most high profile and important criminal justice jobs in the country. It's technically a state level position, so there are different election rules at play. For example, there's no term limits for Manhattan District Attorney. Candidates for the office have different campaign finance rules. And although ranked choice voting is starting this year for city government positions in special and primary elections, ranked choice voting is not at play in the Manhattan District Attorney primary. But the election for Manhattan DA is happening this year at the same time as all the city government elections with a June primary and a fall general election. Got it all? It's okay if not. The most important thing is that you know that the primary is coming up in June and it's time to get to know the candidates running for Manhattan District Attorney. So we're pleased to bring you this new series of interviews with candidates running for Manhattan DA as well as the candidates running for other offices including mayor. These one-on-one -on -one conversations will help to, you to get to know the candidates, learn about their vision, their resume, and what they want to do if they are elected as the top law enforcement official for Manhattan. We hope this and other interviews will be helpful for you as you wade through your many choices and make your decision. So let's get to today's interview. Joining me now by Zoom is Tahani Abushi, a Democratic candidate for Manhattan DA. Welcome. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much for having me, Ben. I'm, I'm excited to, to get in the gutter and talk about the exciting changes coming. Very good. Let's uh, let's get right into it. So take two minutes, though. Introduce yourself, your background, who you are, where you come from and what brings you to this race. And then we'll get into lots of specifics. So I'm a civil rights lawyer. And for over a decade in this city, I have fought against discrimination, excessive force. I represent children who are sexually assaulted in schools. Uh, as well as kids who are bullied, harassed, and are facing suspension hearings. And through my work, I have been able to change policies here in our city that changed the ideology and the culture of how some offices work. And that's the fight that I'm going to take to the Manhattan District Attorney's Office. And for me, the fight for criminal justice reform is more than just an office or an election. It's personal. It's personal because when I was 14, my father was sentenced to 22 years in prison. And overnight, my mother became a single parent of 10 children. And that's the moment that my childhood ended. I survived the damage and destruction that the prosecution system caused and inspired me to become a lawyer, a civil rights lawyer, to come back into our communities, stand by families like mine and hold our systems of authority accountable for all their abuses. And for me, running for Manhattan District Attorney is an opportunity to stop that damage from happening. For every one case I handle, there are thousands more waiting for help. And it's because we have an office, a district attorney, that has just way too much unchecked power. And so my plan is to make this office accountable, transparent, and collaborative with the public. So say a little bit more about your experience, if you would. Um, what kind of cases have you worked on? Uh, you know, who, who have you worked for? Um, you know, what should people know a little bit more about your, your resume as a civil rights attorney? Sure. So we just wrapped up uh, another class action against the NYPD. We partnered with uh, Bell, Doc, Hoffman and Levine, as well as Emory Chelly law firms to ensure that we uh, confirm that the patrol guide will no longer allow for the violation of religious rights uh, during post arrest processing. 
We also handled um, a case against the FDNY that had thinned the ranks of African-American firefighters under the guise of a clean shave policy, which um, inhibited um, firefighters who were African-American uh, from growing a five o'clock shadow even. Um, and so uh, that is up on appeal, but we had that confirmed on summary judgment motion. So that's uh, something I'm very proud of. Uh, and a lot of our cases are excessive force cases, which during my time I've been able to have officers disciplined, terminated, and criminally charged for their misconduct. Uh, on, in addition to that, um, it's important for me, a uh, special place for me to represent children. Uh, for me and my siblings growing up uh, in the aftermath of being touched by the prosecution system, I saw how its roots were deep in every aspect of life, including school, and how children are spoken to, treated, and responded to when they're considered to have stepped out of line is monumental. And for me, suspension hearings um, are an important part of that prison, school to prison pipeline. These are just full-blown trials where kids are uh, subject to cross-examination, the rules of evidence, and, and their education is disrupted. So for me, um, we do pretty much all walks of life as they are imposed upon by our respective agencies in the city. So you've outlined you, you spent a lot of time and, and energy and effort suing the city in different ways. What, in your estimation, if anything, is, is sort of fundamentally or culturally broken that needs fixing? First and foremost is that uh, a badge or a bank, account, a bank account or privilege uh, will make you an exception to the law. And time and time again, those things have been allowed uh, to use this office as a personal law firm, be it the NYPD or the likes of Epstein and Weinstein that have engaged in crimes with impunity in our city. I also think that law enforcement, particularly including the district attorney's office, sees itself separate from the public, although they are obligated and serve the public. And that means the public needs to have a seat at the table as they determine accountability for everyone, including law enforcement. And so in jumping into this race, my goal in making it collaborative is to make it a partner in having a stable, safe and just society for everyone, instead of being a secret exception that is untouchable. So you want to overhaul uh, how the Manhattan District Attorney's Office operates. Um, say a little bit more about what that would look like. What major changes would you make to the structure of the office, um, directives that you give to the uh, bureau heads and the assistant district attorneys? You know, what would sort of the big sweeping changes that you want to bring uh, start with? What are, what are some of the sort of big headlines of those? The only way we're really going to decarcerate society as a whole and really get this office um, to stop destabilizing communities of color is to shrink its footprint. We spend hundreds of thousands of dollars prosecuting social inequities like substance use disorder, poverty, homelessness, mental illness, um, and we don't heal. We just make bad situations worse. So first up on the list is to clean house. Um, and partner with our community-based organizations that can actually address root causes of crimes, invest our resources and our funds into making sure that people have resources. And we don't have to arrest, prosecute, and destabilize homes before we offer this help. And also, we shouldn't be offering the help in the context and structure of law enforcement and the district attorney's office. The second thing we're going to do is reform the Early Case Assessment Bureau. That is the place where the decision is made who to charge, what to charge, and what penalty, if any, to recommend. That office is staged by just prosecutors who are in rotation. We're going to have a standard staff that goes beyond the prosecutor, including social workers, civil rights lawyers, public defenders, that are going to meaningfully assess the allegations that are made, most of which come just from the word of a police officer. And so that is going to be an opportunity for us to further our uh, decline to prosecute policies. And then the third thing that's going to have to happen, we're going to have to clean house. Um, those uh, ADAs, whether they're aligned or executives and staff that are, are willing to further our vision for a new Manhattan um, will be more than welcome to stay. But those who would be obstacles will simply be let go. Because remember, uh, we've just had a series of copy and paste district attorneys here in Manhattan uh, that have brought us to the issues we are facing today, including the mass incarceration and mass criminalization of people of color. 
So what crimes uh, shouldn't be, what, what things that are currently crimes that currently lead to a lot of arrests and prosecutions, what shouldn't be prosecuted in, in your belief and, and you would end prosecutions of? No, so we actually released the policy with a more comprehensive list, but things like um, graffiti, drug possession, sex work, um, gang conspiracy charges or gang charges in general, low level assault charges, um, harassment, disorderly conduct, um, bread and butter charges that police have been known to use to fill quotas and to justify false uh, arrests. And what would you do with uh, people arrested on some of these infractions um, if you're not prosecuting? Well, are, we they have all, are they all uh, simply let go or are you, you talked a little bit about, you know, sort of shifting resources. I assume you have some programs in mind that you want to invest in, some diversion, you know, uh, programs and such. Yeah, absolutely. See, the one thing is we can't have just a, a blanket assumption that these things are impacting public safety because the research shows that it's not. It's essentially turned this office into a massive debt collector for the city where these fines and fees that result from these types of charges go back to the court system or goes to the DA's office, never does it reach the public. Um, and so the programs that we need to invest in are early education programs, after school programs, employment programs, ones that train people with different skills so that they are engaged um, and they are leading a life towards stability in adulthood. But are you insisting from the district attorney's office that you know, that, that people must go into, um, you know, some of these programs or they face prosecution or how do you handle that? Are you, no. are you saying the Manhattan District Attorney's Office should be defunded to a significant degree, a lot fewer attorneys, a lot fewer staff and just let that money go to other programs or how, how does that work in your plan? Yes, that's what it means to shrink the footprint of this office. Right now, law enforcement, including the DA's office, is the first line response to everything that goes on in this city. And, you know, uh, Pat Lynch, there's not much we agree on, but he said two important things this, these last few months. Yeah, this is the leader of the, of the largest police union in the city, for those who don't know. Yes. Yes. Um, at the height of the pandemic, he said, every time a city agency fails, you throw police at it. And then more recently, he said the NYPD has more contact with New Yorkers than any other city agency. And that's exactly the problem here. Um, we don't need to get people help through the structures of law enforcement, which only serve to really destabilize. Um, and it's a negative impact. Uh, nobody gets better after coming through, uh, coming into contact with law enforcement or the district attorney's office. So no, we would not penalize people who do not want to take the option of diversion programs, but we will consider ourselves a partner in ensuring that there's stability and prevention. Because right now we are a knee jerk reaction system where after things happen, we jump in and there's panic, there's revenge type prosecution, but we aren't considering what happens next, what happens to the families and the communities that are impacted, not only by the underlying incident, but our actions in response. What crimes would you prosecute and, you know, what, um, What's your approach to who, who does um, you know, belong or who, who do you, would you pursue a jail sentence for? What kind of crimes? So this is something that uh, I wouldn't propose a wholesale blanket response to. I think we have to be case specific, look at the facts, the sources of evidence, and make sure that the victims and community, community leaders are part of the steps we take. Things that are priority on my table are cases of sexual assaults, rapes, who have been strongly neglected by this office. Um, even the issues with rape kits that were found stored in various storage units. Um, that neglect is going to be my priority. White collar crimes, uh, Wall Street crimes, those that have brought our country to its knees time and time again, wiping out people's retirements and life savings, pulling people's homes after they've paid their mortgages for decades, just abusive financial crimes that we have become too comfortable with looking the other way when our society right now is uh, unstable because of them. So say a little bit more about those. What kind of white collar crime do you think needs to be prioritized? Um, do you think the current, it sounds like you think the current Manhattan District Attorney's Office has not been aggressive enough on those. Um, how would you do that? What would you focus on? Uh, wage theft is a big one, uh, including Ponzi schemes and those that have forced people to invest their retirement savings 
um, and don't see anything in return. Um, and I think that, you know, the story of Donald Trump and Weinstein is, and Epstein are just a highlight of what has been occurring, not only in the Manhattan DA's office, but the general response of law enforcement to those who are in power and who have that kind of privilege. Um, so even the question with Trump is, should we do something about this? Should we just heal and move forward? But you can't heal without accountability, without allowing the victims to be heard and to be part of that decision-making process. Um, and so while Wall Street is, yes, very powerful, they're not above the law. And our, our goal here is to center justice around people, not money. So you, you mentioned um, sex crimes and white collar crime. What about gun crime? What would your approach, you know, we just saw a year in, in 2020 with a, a big spike in shootings, a big spike in murders in the city. What would your approach to gun crime be? And if in that answer, you can sort of get at the difference between the many gun possession charges that often occur and then the notion of the, the shootings, uh, which are which are very often, uh, there's a lot of difference there, there's a lot of different numbers, and then there's a lot of different uh, sort of clearance rates on those. Right, um, and I think that for me, <clears throat> I work with a lot of community-based organizations, a lot of crisis management systems like Street Corner Resources and Life Camp, who are community, community leaders that have been on the ground for a very long time grappling with this issue. Uh, and you can identify things that can help us uh, prevent these things from happening before they become our gun issue. We can see instability in some of our neighborhoods and the response has to be resources. Because right now we have a massive NYPD budget, a massive district attorney budget. We have some of the harshest sentencing laws in the country. All we ever do is really prosecute and incarcerate um, and then we're still talking about our gun issue. We're still talking about crime being an issue. And so we have to do something different and to respond with just more prosecution and police is really reckless. Just quickly, sorry. I mean, to be fair, before this, this very significant increase in, in 2020, which again coincided with a, a pandemic that, you know, changed everything and we don't really know a lot of the, you know, the causes of, of what happened and that needs to still be further examined. But before that, the general trend over decades was a lot less uh, gun crime in the city. A lot less so, gun crime in the city. There were programs like the gun buyback program. There were programs that allowed the youth to be intercepted and have violence interference programs where they did engage them in school and after school programs. But you mentioned something very important that's really part of the conversation is a pandemic where people are strapped for money. There's unemployment is high. People are facing evictions. Uh, the summer youth program uh, was cut off. So there's a lot of resources were defunded. A lot of agencies couldn't provide resources that they were providing. And even in speaking with crisis management systems that are still on the ground throughout, it has been difficult. But again, even responding with prosecution, a lot of these gun cases are rarely cleared, but also as we incarcerate people for longer times in prison, they come out and they're even further destabilized as is the community. So the response for me will always be wholesale investing early on as possible in our communities with as many resources as possible and, and trying to use incarceration as a last resort where possible. So what is um, your approach to a first time gun possession charge look like? The presumption would be to work to declare. Arrest, I should say. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, well, we'd obviously always review all the evidence, but the intention presumption would be, can we decline this case and instead provide resources? You know, gun possession versus discharging a weapon and injuring a person are different levels. Um, and we can't allow our imagination to jump to the what if X happened and focus on what did happen and how we can prevent it. So that, so that was going to be my next question. So on a discharge, uh, an injury, a shooting where uh, someone does shoot a gun and, and injure somebody, uh, what does your approach to that look like? Let's again say it's the first time offense for that person. I mean, we're still going to hold people accountable. Um, we don't uh, condone these types of behaviors, but we'll also ensure that the victim has a seat at the table and that the community understands that whatever response here has to include a healing for the whole community. A lot of shootings 
um, we take them as just that isolated shooting, but it's part of a larger problem, uh, a larger issue in the community that we might not be aware of and we could exacerbate. Even if we incarcerate somebody two, three, four, five years, uh, doesn't mean we've alleviated the underlying issues that gave rise to this. Um, so it would be a collective effort to try and figure out how to respond, which still incarceration being a last resort, but obviously as district attorney, we are prosecutors at the end of the day. And so that option is always on the table. So that is, I, I think, sort of the, the next uh, line of the, of the conversation is who does, you know, what kinds of crime do you think uh, do deserve to lead to significant uh, jail or prison sentences? And do you think that there's a certain number of years that should be sort of the maximum uh, sentence that, that anybody can serve? Yes, I, for us, we put out a policy and a commitment that we're limiting uh, jail sentences or prison sentences rather to 20 years. Um, that is really a global level um, standard that other countries have adhered to. And the reason, one of the main reasons for that is, look, my father spent over 19, 19 and a half, 20 years in prison. Um, he came out at 60 years old. He had had triple bypass surgery, had his health issues. Um, and had he not had his family around him and a home to come to, what would we expect from this individual? Um, and so because we are one of the countries that incarcerate people longer than any other place, um, we have become what, what I've heard been called um, a high security nursing home where we're dealing, we're spending billions of dollars on palliative care uh, and pain management because people are not only aging faster, but they're dying in prison from their sentences. And so when I say I'm against the death penalty, I'm against death by incarceration. It costs us an insane amount of money, desperately needed money that can be used to invest in resources. And it also has not been shown to impact the public safety. Uh, and so we would cap it at 20 years and we would ensure that, again, incarceration is not only a last resort, but is it going to, um, is it going to be the response that for our why? What is the purpose of doing it? Why, what are we accomplishing from here? What is the victim and community want to see happen here? Along with violent crime over, over decades um, declining significantly, the city's jail population has also declined significantly over decades and really taken um, you know, some other big leaps downward in recent years as the city council and the mayor made a number of, of crimes into violations or civil penalties versus, versus criminal. Um, we've seen some you know, fluctuation in the last couple of years, especially during the pandemic, um, but do you have a sense, you know, the, the city jail population, let's say, is, is around 4,500, 5,000. Um, do you have a sense of what you think it should be? For me, especially pretrial detention should be down to as close to zero as possible. We have to understand that our presumption of innocence is a prized cornerstone of our democracy and people must be treated as innocent until proven guilty. Um, and so we also must move away from an economic um, structure of assessing people's innocence and their ability to stay home and continue their lives as their cases are being resolved versus being held in. And we have plenty of examples, um, uh, unfortunate examples as to why we need to do that with urgency. And so um, for me, uh, I was a, a, a proponent of closing Rikers and not building new jails because we have enough. And it, the more we build, the more we're going to fill it. And as you stated, we're filling it with um, people who, are ultimately going to be charged in, with things that result in fines and fees, making us again a debt collector and trapping people in an abusive cycle in the criminal justice system that prevents them from meaningfully moving on with their lives. So we're unfortunately already in our last few minutes here, but we do have a couple more minutes. I wanna zoom way back out um, to kind of come back a little bit to where we started about your background, your resume. This position of Manhattan District Attorney is the lead prosecutor. You've talked a lot um, in our discussion here about you know, your philosophy around how you'd run the office, but it is a big management job. There's well over a thousand employees uh, now. You said you want to uh, shrink the footprint, but there's currently well over a thousand employees, $120 million plus annual budget. Can you speak a little bit to your management experience and what kind of leap this would be uh, for you to run an office that size? 
Absolutely. I mean, this is not a one woman show. This is an office that will be run with people who, again, are going to further our vision to shrink the footprint of the office and center justice around people. And that is why I'm comfortable with being prepared to clean house and bring in people, not former district attorneys that have uh, only ever known one way, but public defenders, civil rights attorneys, social workers, teachers, mental health professionals, community leaders. Because again, this is something that should be, this is an office that should be collaborative with the public. And for me, uh, I am the only candidate in this race that has the experience of collaborating and bringing together community leaders, city agencies, elected officials, and navigating adversarial waters, especially with agencies like the NYPD, and actually changing ideology and culture. Um, and that's not to be underestimated because what we're saying here sounds great, but like you mentioned, the reality is we're gonna get in that office and we're not gonna be around a cheerleading squad, right? We're gonna have people who are just used to doing things a very different way. And we're going to have to help them see that this is the way forward, um, encourage them to do so. And so for me, you know, even suing the NYPD and then sitting across the table from the police commissioner and his legal team to say, this is how we're gonna do it different and getting everyone on board to do things differently um, is a very important skill to have going into this position. And you don't think that a lack of prosecutorial experience going into a, a top prosecutor job should give voters pause? No, I think district attorneys uh, don't try cases, they create policy. Uh, and uh, frankly, I don't need years of experience in prosecution and incarcerating people to know what works and what doesn't. Um, anyone can file charges. Anyone can stand up there and say that we're ready for trial. I'm a trial lawyer. I try cases in federal and state court, and I've navigated not only how the police and our city agencies work, but how our courts will lean and what the public wants to see um, through the jury process. So all of that experience um, is important, but the bigger thing here to focus is on what is the direction we're going to take this office? Two last questions, and, and they both uh, unfortunately have to have brief answers in our, in our allotted time here, but appreciate the time. One is, from what you've seen so far, do you think that uh, Donald Trump as a private citizen should um, be brought up on charges uh, through the Manhattan District Attorney's Office? Um, well, from things that we have seen uh, from victims who are alleging sexual assaults um, to fraud, defrauding uh, charities, to wage theft, to uh, you name it, we've seen a lot of things. And right now, as civilians, we're only seeing what's been said. And I've heard the Supreme Court arguments um, against the subpoenas and trying to gather what is really out there. But the, the question shouldn't be, should we do it? Um, that's not a, a privilege afforded to the mass of the public. Uh, we should hold him accountable because he represents a large part of people in the country. And what we even seen happen in the Capitol, where when you have that kind of privilege, you can evade even the question of being held accountable. And, and lastly, is there a prosecutor or, or two, if you want, but a current or, or former that you look up to as role models? Are there people who are in uh, district attorney or other roles that, you know, you may not agree with 100% on with everything, but, um, you know, that you hold up as a role model? Yeah, I think for me, um, DA Rollins and Gardner and actually Krasner and, and Boudin as well. Uh, I think they have done a phenomenal job. It's hard. It's hard to change the course of an office that has done things the same way for centuries, that has over relied on incarceration and prosecution, but also to bring their personal backgrounds and their perspective uh, into uncharted territory and, and stay strong in their commitment to real justice, um, navigating the adversarial waters. And I think they've done a great job so far. All right. Well, unfortunately, we're going to have to leave it there. But thank you for all the time. Tahani Abushi is a Democrat running for Manhattan District Attorney. Thank you for joining me. Thank you so much, Ben. And thank you for watching Decision NYC with Ben Max. Key decisions for New York City voters are coming up in June and the fall, including for Manhattan Democratic voters in this primary. There's a lot on the line for all of us and the future of the city and the borough of Manhattan. I hope this conversation was helpful. I'm Ben Max. See you next time.